Good morning. No, sorry. Thank you. Let's take care of some housekeeping. I'm going to repeat this from yesterday. Those little spongy balls that you got in the bags, those are for throwing at people whose cell phones go off. All right? So, so please put your cell phones on, buzz, off, vibrate, anything that makes a sound, that does not make a sound. Thank you. Shared cabs to the airport tomorrow if you're not going to get on the bus. So if you're leaving earlier on Saturday, there's a sign-up board in the registration where you can put your name and try to coordinate with other people to share cabs to the airport. Registration room tomorrow. We'd like to thank, I didn't do this at the dinner, and so I want to make sure I do it here. I wanted to thank ExamSoft for their sponsorship of the dinner last night. That was kind of nice, wasn't it? Thanks, folks. And the only other thing is, this is our last, this is our last time together. This is our last plenary. And so I wanted to remind you that next year we're going to some boring city called Las Vegas. <clears throat> and uh, you should consider coming back to this conference if you enjoyed this one. All right, let me introduce our plenary speaker today. His name is James Boyle. He teaches at Duke Law School, and he's the co-founder of the Center for the Study of the Public Domain, and the only law professor I know who is both a character and a co-author of a comic book. James? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you've no idea how much of a pleasure it is because last night I asked the hotel people, so the conference is right here at the Cali conference. Oh, yes, they said, just downstairs, third floor. Um, so when I walked down at 8.30 and walked and was directed from one room to another to another on the third floor and no Cali people to be found and finally find someone who said, oh, no, 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 actually it's some distance from here. I was somewhat concerned that I would be here on time. Luckily, I met a uh, charming Haitian taxi driver with a very large supply of pornography in his car. I'm not quite sure <laughs> whether or not this was supposed to while away the time on, you know, busy freeway commutes or whatever. Um, Anyway, luck, my, my schoolboy French came in useful, and here I am. Um, but if I don't stop shaking until halfway through the talk, you'll understand why. Um, he, he did make eye contact throughout the entire journey. Um, and the phrase, I know where that was, I know where that is, which was the only phrase that he, he repeated constantly um, as he randomly named various towns and cities in the greater Fort Lauderdale area, failed to give me the reassurance it was supposed to. Um, so, thank you. It's nice to be here. Um, uh, and uh, I, I have to say that the second thing that I will say in introduction is... Um, I've grown used to increasingly strange looks when I give a presentation and I don't have a PowerPoint. In fact, I gave a plenary at an EDUCAUSE conference, and they said, um, where, where are your slides? I said, I don't use slides. They go, this is a plenary. I said, I know. What will you use, she said. I, words? <laughs> she goes, but how will we get them onto the screen? <laughs> And right as I went to go in, one of the people ran up. He goes, hey, are you one of those no PowerPoint guys? And I said, in the sense that I don't use them, yes. He goes, I've heard about people like you. <laughs> <laughs> the lost no PowerPoint guys of the Kalahari. Um, a a, a uh, Discovery Channel special to be coming soon to you. Um, anyway, um, welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Thanks to John for inviting me, and thanks to you for, for being here. Um, I'm going to talk about um, what we don't know and think that we do know about educational technologies. Um, and uh, that part of the talk may seem a little depressing because I'm basically going to give a litany of ways in which we fail to understand technologies, uh, predict the future badly, 
um, and have systematic biases that lead us to make erroneous decisions. So all of that sounds kind of like a downer, and you might think, oh, dear, this guy's from Scotland. We're going to get another, you know, fire and damnation, spider in the hand of an angry god kind of talk. But no, um, in fact, um, my point is an optimistic one. Um, because what I'm going to talk about um, is uh, the ways in which we can come to understand our own biases um, and the ways in which we can compensate for them. So let me start with behavioral economics. You think, oh, great, it's not even 9.15 and we're on to economics. But no, it turns out behavioral economics is a little bit more interesting than economics. Behavioral economists are those economists, frequently drawing a lot on psychology, social psychology, who have managed to convince economists what the rest of us always thought, that people don't act in the way that the homo economicus, the rational actor, is supposed to act. Um, the behavioral economists, by extensive uh, study, actual empirical study, have shown that people systematically don't act in the way that um, wealth-maximizing rational individuals would act. And all of you who are not economists might say, well, see, told you. But actually, behavioral econom economics goes a little further than that. The behavioral economists have also found that people's non-economic action, non-rational from the point of view of an economist action, is not just random. It's not just a bunch of dots scattered on a screen deviating from the beautiful curve that the economists would predict. It's patterned. Let me give you an example. It turns out that we vastly overvalue potential losses and undervalue potential gains, at least as far as economic theory is concerned. So as far as an economist is concerned, a 50% chance of losing $5 or a 50% chance of gaining $5 ought to be you know, fairly similar to you. The, your calculation of what you would do to get one or avoid the other ought to be exactly the same. We're supposed to be risk neutral, neither risk preferring nor risk averse. Okay? It's not true. We're much more worried about potential losses. Now, you're a smart, technologically smart group, smart and technologically smart group, so I won't <laughs> say this, but you probably know people who buy extensive product warranties. And anyone who's ever looked at them go, why do people buy these things? It's insane. You buy a whole bunch of products over your lifetime. Some of them are going to go belly up. Most of them won't. Why pay this insanely inflated insurance policy in order to get two years of peace of mind, one year of which is probably already covered by the manufacturer's warranty? It's a business that ought not to exist as far as economists are concerned. People should look at it and go, this is crazy. I'll self-insure. Or if they're really, really anal, they say, I'll actually go to an insurance broker, an insurance market would exist, and say, give me a lifetime warranty on all my appliances that I'll ever buy. And one would be provided if this were a rational market at a fraction of a cost of what you pay for your warranty on your dishwasher, warranty on your TV, warranty, et cetera, et cetera, that you buy from Best Buy, and which actually makes up an enormous portion of their product, their profit margin. But that market does exist. Because people can't bear the thought that having been offered the warranty, they might turn it down and 91 days after they leave the store have the whole refrigerator stop working. We wish to avoid regret. The economists say, well, you oughtn't to. You ought to, you know, the rational actor would just calculate. No, we will pay to avoid regret. Uh, and we will pay handsomely, in fact, excessively. That's an example of a patterned set of behaviors that behavioral economics teaches us that economics predicts exactly the opposite, right? So we will be loss averse. I'm using this as an analogy because I think there are similar patterns in the ways in which we misperceive or misunderstand technology, right? It's not just we're wrong, it's we're wrong in certain directions or in certain ways. Now, um, economists have been understandably not terribly keen on behavioral economics. Um, one of them, a Nobel Prize winner who went to meet Kahneman and Tversky, who are the originators of it, they later won a Nobel Prize for it too, said, I'm not interested in the psychology of stupid people. <laughs> but I think we should be, because I think we're all stupid people, or at least I think we can all understand or should understand the ways in which our, um, our particular biases, our particular frames, frames of reference, change our view. So let me start with two postulates, applying this to the world of technology and technology-mediated education. The first one ought to be one that needs little proof to this group. 
We are horrendously bad at predicting the uses of technology. Horrendously bad. Repeatedly, anyone who studies the history of technology and it's well worth studying will say that if there's one thing that is a constant, it is repeated failure to predict whether or how a technology will be used. When the telephone was first introduced, people thought, at last we have our method for delivering weather reports. The idea was everyone would pick up the phone at like 8 p.m. and listen as somebody on the other end read the weather report. It was a one-to-many communication system they imagined. You'd pick it up, let, oh, it's 7 o'clock, the symphony will be on, and you would listen to the symphony. When it was suggested that this would be a two-way communications device, people said, why? What would people find to talk about? Good question. When cell phones were introduced, the FCC looked at them and said, yeah, we see 400,000 to 600,000 market in the United States, million and a half tops worldwide. Would that they had been right? <laughs> People look at technology, particularly communications technologies, and just get them wrong. Or they fail to understand what the killer app will be. You know, you get it 90% of the way, and then you find that the last 10% is something that you didn't even think of. Why would, we, why would this be the thing that suddenly makes this incredibly attractive to people? So if you look at the history of technology, we're quite bad at predicting how technologies will be used. Um, we, we just fail to understand it in, in lots of ways. I mean, there are certain constants, um, many of which you will know. So, for example, um, the early adopters on, in, on any um, technology of communication or reproduction are almost always pornographers who appear to have marginally better predictive abilities than the, better, but the rest of us. I actually should have asked my taxi driver for some hints. <laughs> on what to say today, but with the exception, I'm quite serious about that. There's actually some interesting empirical studies or uh, academic studies about the ways in which um, uh, pornography drove the early lithography and photography business and the ways in which it drove the VCR and so forth. So, I mean, the pornographers appear to be ahead of the curve. So, I mean, but I, I figure I can't go to a Cali conference and tell the people responsible for uh, technology education within legal education to say, ask your neighborhood pornographer. I have to come up with something more inspiring than that. Um, as I seek to do it, and I, and I hope that I do. So the first, the first comment is just a kind of a, a comment of humility, uh, of acceptance that we should not have too much hubris about our ability to predict how our educational technologies, softwares, et cetera, are going to be used, how they will be attractive, how they will work with other people's minds. Um, the second um, uh, hypothesis about our, our uh, understanding our own limitations and distortions is that we are systematically bad at predicting the power of what you might call open or commons-based systems of development or innovation. Um, I'll, I'll give you some examples because there's no nice word to describe this. There's no single word. Some people call them peer production systems. Some people call them open systems, open source systems, uh, systems which operate around a commons. Um, we should understand these because we're very useful to, uh, they're very useful to us. English is such a system. Um, we don't have to pay to use English, um, at least in theory. Uh, we should all be running the same version. There's no version incompatibility. Now, this, of course, as we know, is not true frequently between parents and children. Um, <laughs> my own students are running English 0 0.5, but um, there are Nevertheless, this is an open system. No permission is required. There's no end user license agreement required for me to formulate a sentence, nor are there hidden APIs that restrict my ability to do so. Uh, those are open. They're at least available. And indeed, I can change them. I can produce new words, neologisms, indeed new grammatical forms. I'm allowed to do that. That's actually the way that language works, right? That's the normal system. English is an open system. You might say, well, of course, all languages are. Not true at all. Um, as you should understand, studying law, lawyers through history have systematically managed to get legal language to be a non-open system. Now, famously, just legal jargon is incomprehensible to other people, but if you look back to law French, for example, that was an invented professional language deliberately designed to exclude others, which allowed a professional monopoly to be solidified and deployed. Right? The early common lawyers were the Microsoft of the, of the common law. They had a closed system to which people needed access. In order to need access, you had to sign on to uh, massively restrictive end user license agreements called indenture agreements, which restricted your ability to do things. And 
the whole thing was run by uh, a group of people whose interests were not necessarily in transparency, right? So the scribal languages um, through the, the, uh, in, the, the, um, in Mesopotamia and elsewhere are another fine example. So not all languages are open. But there's an example, a, a, an open system of communication. But what specifically do I mean about us being bad at predicting um, the power of open and particularly collaborative systems. Well, so I want to um, do a little experiment here, and it's not a real experiment. It's kind of a thought experiment. What I'd like to do is, as it were, surgically to remove your last 10 years' experience from you so that you don't really know anything that happened since 1996, maybe even 1995. There's some, probably some things you'd rather not remember during that time. You might be actually grateful. The whole Iraq thing just disappears, you know. Um, so at least the, the second one. Um, so there's, you know, but I want you specifically to forget everything that you know about the development of technology and specifically the World Wide Web during that period. So now it's the 1995 you, okay? So I come to you and I say, okay, I want to build the greatest reference work the world has ever seen. I want all information about pretty much everything to be available. You want pretty much everything? He's like, yeah, I want like the encyclopedia, not Britannica, I want the encyclopedia Galactica. I want all of human experience. I don't just want to know, you know, what Ecuador's main export is. I want to know where the best place to eat in Ecuador is. I want to know what the psychological hang-ups of Ecuadorians. I want to know how their football team's doing now, right? And I want to know that about everything, you know, Saluki dogs, kinds of pond grass. I want to know it about Kathmandu. I want to know about the details of the scribal languages I just mentioned, right? I want to know about Acadian. I want to know about Law French. All that? Yeah, I want to know it all. So what do I need? I mean, you guys are experts, and presumably were then experts, about how to deploy educational systems, learning systems. What do I need? You go, wow. Well, we're going to need a project kind of like the Manhattan Project, except to build an encyclopedia, right? We're going to need very tight control over it. I mean, first of all, obviously, we're going to need strong copyright to control it, but also strong trademark. You know, we'll call it the Encyclopedia Boileana, and, and that will become the mark for the greatest uh, reference work ever. And we want to make sure that nobody uses that mark without our permission because that's going to be the insignia of quality. That's how people will know that it's there and it's true. We're going to have to be able to control our contributors, make sure they don't give us stuff that's wrong. You know, get all that Area 51 stuff out of here or into here if you happen to believe it. Um, right? Let's make sure that we have high quality material. And to do that, I have to be able to hire and fire pretty much at will. I have to be able to edit. No, I'm sorry, this is work for hire. I don't care what you think is right about Ecuador. I'm changing your words and putting something else in there. Uh, you have no ability to control the final product. And I have to have incredible control over it, right? As I release it, there's this new electronic digital stuff coming along. Massive DRM. No one gets to input it, but input into it except people I say, et cetera, et cetera, right? Wouldn't this be what you said as of 1995? I mean, how else could we imagine building a reference work? Control, 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 physical control, editorial control, property rights control at every stage. So when's the last time any of you looked in an encyclopedia? Now, I mean, I still occasionally do. Uh, I actually have a first edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica in which I have to say, since this was written by my Scottish forebears, that I am delighted to say that the... the um, Entry on accountancy is 110 pages long, and the entry on brewing is 140 pages long. <laughs> and that's just in the A to B volume. Um, um, our assumptions about how you produce high-quality research material and so forth simply would not have enabled us, even if we're a technological fantasist, to predict the success of the Internet. I just, don't just mean Wikipedia. I mean the Internet, the World Wide Web to produce through a curious pattern of kind of globally distributed peer review through waterhole 
search engines, waterhole algorithm. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't have a map of where the waterhole is. You follow the tracks of the other animals if you want to find the waterhole. Right? Don't say what's the best site of Ecuador. Say where does everybody else link to? Okay, that helps to give us material. This amazing decentralized, dispersed, non-controlled, non-hierarchically arranged, non-property rights restricted system has woven together inputs from the entire world and bizarrely enough. Remember when the internet was a byword for bad factual information? Now, it's, there's still tons of bad factual information on it. Nevertheless, the fact that most of you did not say, no, I still use the encyclopedia, indicates something to me, right? It's not just the internet, of course. You have stuff in your head, social software, that allows you to process the material. I think I'll bypass that Area 51 site. Oh, this is a site from a university. I'll give that extra credibility and so forth. We apply filters ourselves, of course. It's not just the material. But here's an example of our inability to predict the power of an open system to generate a high-quality factual resource. And again, I want to stress, at every level, the way the product would be arranged, right? who would organize it, how it would be controlled, employment relationships, property rights. Second example, same thing. Last 10, 11 years is gone. Um, maybe even we'll take you back a little bit further, right to the very birth of the World Wide Web. Um, so we're in a room in Washington, and uh, this guy Berners Lee comes in and says, "So yeah, I have this great idea for a system, and you know we could link things together. And of course, it'd probably be you know mainly physics pages, but you know it could be open like this, and then it would develop into you know all kinds of things, and there would be culture up there, and e-commerce, and and it would actually be this web that linked the world together, and so there's a nice, you know, reasonable group of Washington bureaucrats, industry representatives, academics, and so forth. And our job is to design the information superhighway. Remember the information superhighway, right? The idea was superhighway, right? Planned, centralized. <laughs> we don't let random people decide where, decide where I-40 is, right? The government decides where I-40 is, you know, or at least the people who pay the government do. They decide where I-40 is, right? No, the information superhighway is a classic Eisenhower metaphor, top-down design. We'll provide the superstructure. You little guys use it. Of course, that wasn't the way that it developed. Now, put you in that room, take out your experience of the last 11, 12 years, and what would you do? So the guy babbles on about open protocols and open systems and HTML and TCP IP, and they'll all be open and they won't be controlled, and anyone could hook in, and there's this end-to-end -end principle, and we'll leave all the intelligence at the ends, which will allow anyone to do whatever they want with it. They could innovate over it. What would you think? You'd think, he's a lunatic. He's a lunatic. I mean, that's absurd. I mean, there'd be pornography. Check. See, that's the principle going back to principle number one, right? And there is, right? There'll be spam. There'll be people saying they know stuff who don't know stuff. There'll be people like, I mean, I could go out there and like claim to know what's going on about weapons of mass destruction, even though I didn't write for the New York Times. You know, that's absurd, right? I mean, you, you could have just anyone doing anything. There would be no control. There'd be no authentication. You wouldn't know where they were coming from. There would be viruses. There would be Trojans. And there are. There would be piracy. And there is massive amounts of illicit copying. Come on, how many of you think, no matter how in your heart of hearts, I'm a kind of open kind of person, how many of you think you would design the World Wide Web? Of course you wouldn't. You'd design Minitel. That's what you design, the French closed network system. And as to the stuff on either end, would you design the general purpose computer? No, you'd, you'd design the terminal, right? That's what you design. That's what I would design. You don't want people to be able to do whatever they want. They'll do bad things and they'll mess things up, right? We can't leave it to them. True? I think it's true. I think if we had the task over again, we would design Minitel. We would design a closed system. You know, the New York Times might get on. <laughs> you wouldn't, right? And we'd authenticate. And, you know, th in many ways, there would be some advantages. There would be fewer viruses, probably. There would be less porn, unless it was officially sanctioned. And there would be less piracy. And there would be none of the other stuff, either. All the stuff that probably it's a fairly safe bet in this room you come to cherish and value so much, and that continues to evolve faster than we can even keep, keep pace with it. So I think these two examples, admittedly, they're not real psychological experiments. They're thought experiments. But if I'm right, they have some bite. It's like, we're at the heart of this, and we wouldn't do it.
because we because our assumption is and it's an assumption based on control of tangible things it's set to silent network tangible things the, that's how we're built up we learn to deal with things by dealing with rival property if i have this water you can't have it and that's what hardwires our assumptions about how to deal with it wait have it be everybody's water? I don't think so. Everyone can drink from it and just put the cap back on? I don't think so. You know, you can have it just because you're thirsty? I don't think so. No, that's the way we start by assuming. We don't yet even begin to think in the intangible world. We don't think about non-rival property. You can have my idea and I can have it too. We're still not very good about doing it. Back to, excuse me, principle number one, which is we don't understand it. Okay. So, two principles. We're bad at predicting the future, number one, just in general. Two, more specifically, we're systematically bad at predicting the value and power of open systems. Systems in which, to the greatest extent possible, as many people as possible are able not simply to use, but to comment on, to redesign, to recreate, to make modular, to turn it into their own thing, to come up with things that we haven't even thought about doing. We're just very bad at predicting that. And so given our druthers, we tend to reinvent Minitel and the Encyclopedia Britannica again and again and again in every new area of technology. And we're probably doing it right now in this room. So behavioral economics, as I said, though, is not a entirely pessimistic message. It also tells us that we can learn from our biases and choose to embrace them or not as we wish. Now, you might actually choose when it comes to behavioral economics to say, no, I still want to be loss averse. I actually, I think the economists are wrong on that. I do have this, you know, soul searing feeling of regret when my dishwasher breaks after 91 days and I'm gonna pay for the stupid warranty and I don't care that you think that's irrational. It makes me feel good and after all, that's what economics is all about. That's fine because then you're doing it in full knowledge of what you're giving up and what you're getting, right? You're not assuming that it's just a straightforward rational calculation. You're saying there's an extra something in there for me. And there often is an extra something in there. There are reasons why we don't want everything to be an open system. I don't, don't particularly want my bank account to be an open system. Uh, why? Because my bank account is a lot more like this than it is like Linux. Um, once other people can get in there and do things, that's actually going to mess me up quite seriously. I don't want our students' grades to be a system where anyone can get it. You know, actually it felt more like a 4.1 to me. You know, uh, it's just the way, you know. Uh, no, it's not that we want to run happily screaming and, you know, hug the, the, the closest open source uh, programmer. It's not that this is always the answer. That's not my message at all. Quite the contrary. What we learn from looking at both the history of technology and the specific developments that I'm talking about is that innovation actually proceeds from a mixture of openness and control. And that frequently we want the control and the control is a good thing, whether in property rights, organization, technological structure, DRM or what have you. The point that I'm making is we need a balance of the two and we undervalue one side and overvalue the other. I don't want to be understood to say, and so I'm gonna say it one more time, I'm not saying everything in the whole world has to be open and that's the only way. Quite the contrary. What I'm saying is be aware that we have inbuilt biases in a particular direction and so look more carefully. Okay, so now to specific applications. Let me give you a move slightly more concrete with an example. Recently I was at a, a conference talking to a bunch of um, uh, humanities people and people who design digital archives and they were describing their digital archives that they make for people in universities amazing things you know sort of archaeological artifacts photographed in three dimensions you can rotate them so that you actually can allow the anthropologist the archaeologist to examine something remotely you know to manipulate it and so forth amazing like 27 metadata field search keys so that you can search in all kinds of uh, fab fabulous ways and that the librarians went through their um, went through their systems and described them with enormous, you know, pleasure and described how incredibly fine-tuned the metadata was and how they coded for this and coded for that and did this and you could do that. And at the end of it, someone from the floor said, "Yeah, how many people use them?" That it turned out was a little inconvenient. 
It turned out that large numbers of these systems were being deployed to target populations who didn't use them at all. Why? Well, said one librarian, they use Google. That's kind of sad. Um, now, there are two reasons for that, I think. The first is that the metadata fields, no matter how brilliantly done, had been described, designed by the librarians rather than by the user community. And that, as we all know, is a problem because the way that we understand things when we're thinking as archivists is not necessarily at all the way that the person who's got a problem to solve, I need to know whether this pot shard is the same as, different from, this other one, they may have completely different frames of reference. Now, all of you who do library work will say, well, come on, the first thing we do is talk to our users. And that certainly would be one of the takeaways from my talk, that we should be aware that we need much more ongoing and frequent consultation with the people who are specifically going to use our products because they're going to have um, much more input to it. But we generally, um, at least in many examples of the use of educational technology, we restrict that to early upfront saying, what do you want to do, and then beta testing. The idea that the people who are our users would also be our developers, that's not an idea that we have fully, um, I think, begun to, to uh, uh, play with. So what am I suggesting? What I'm suggesting is a general design principle. The design principle is that to the greatest extent possible, first of all, all the material that you have there should be as made available to as widely as is possible. Now, there, there may be legal restrictions uh, for obvious reasons. You may, be, you may have to do this behind a firewall, either because of the TEACH Act or because, because the material is copyrighted. Um, so it's not always uh, possible. But to the extent possible, and often it's more possible than we think, we should push to have all of the educational material that we're using be available to the general public. Not just because it's part of our public service as educators to make stuff available to the public, which all of us understand, I think, and all of us do, but because we will find that when we do that, you end up getting interesting stuff back. You actually start getting feedback and uses and add-ons and so forth that you hadn't thought about. A classic example of this is Google Maps. Now, Google Maps is very interesting because it's a constant fusion of open and closed. There's all kinds of stuff that's being put in there, both software but also content, where people are taking from public databases crime records, right? They're taking from weather statistics, topographical features, prediction, what's the best place to go and eat in this city in Ecuador, et cetera, et cetera. And they're layering it all on there. The users are the creators, but they're also taking other stuff. Hey, wouldn't it be great if somebody took that database that the federal government compiled about rainfall rates and layered it on here? Because that would be really useful to me. And by the way, I'll make it available to everyone else. That's how Google Maps works. Constant layering like a baklava of public, private, open, closed, public, private, open, closed. That's what makes it so interesting or exciting. What is the comparable product in legal education? Eh. Don't really see one. Um, a second example or a second, a second thought on this. If the first principle is to the greatest extent possible, make the material available to everyone, we may find that there are people out there who are an audience for our work that we had not previously thought. Um, when the NIH and the government more generally began putting medical data online, particularly um, uh, abstracts of journal articles uh, in Medline, they assumed that they were doing it for researchers and doctors. They found that there was an enormous number of people out there who wanted to know did my doctor give me the right diagnosis? Where can I find out about this? Is my family practitioner in you know, an isolated town actually up to snuff on the latest uh, information on this? My kid has a horrifying disease. I want to do research on it. And more and more and more, they find that Medline was actually being used by everyday citizens. Now, as with the web, right? This leads to lots of bad things, too. The equivalence of porn, piracy, viruses, right? So people go, I'm sure I have some weird disease. You know, they come into their doctor with a sheaf of printouts, right? Absolutely, there are costs. There are always costs to openness. But there are also benefits. If you look at a lot of the studies on internet-enabled medicine, people catch things earlier. They check diagnoses. Um, by the way, the single best uh, predictor on whether or not you're going to suffer malpractice in your medical care is how many questions you ask. There you go. Interesting study. Single best predictor. Uh, race and wealth are very close, but 
but the best predictor is how many questions you ask. Ask questions, guys. Um, the other thing is the average number of words uh, that a patient is allowed to get out before a doctor interrupts them is eight. Um, what's happening here is a little bit like what happened to Law French. And some doctors like it and some doctors don't, just as the people who spoke Law French didn't like it. Now, by the way, Law French had its benefits like any closed system. I could say devises with the Z, and you would know what I meant because it was entirely an intra-professional system. There were no troublesome lay meanings layered on top of it, right? Think of property, how much trouble that gets us into, right? That word is a word that we get to use as lawyers, but so does everybody else, and many of the meanings blur and shift. Closed systems work, but they have limitations. So what's happening is, just as happened with Law French, we're having the boundaries of the medical profession changed by this influx of information. What would happen if the same thing happened with law? Well, to some extent it is. But ours is a very, very hard system to decode. Because if you have a pain in your knee, at least you know you have a pain in your knee. right? And you can Google pain in knee. If you're sophisticated, you might say pain outside of knee. Right? Uh, right side. You know, you, you, could, you could come up with terms and you can refine your searches. How do we do that for the law? That's a lot harder, right? Because there's a lot of pre processing. If you don't know that the thing that is, you're involved in is a copyright dispute, how do you even frame the question in order to get back information? So I'm not underestimating the difficulties of doing this, but what I'd like to imagine is that we are part of a community whose job it is to help undermine the professional walls that surround us. I'm skeptical of professional monopolies. I think they have benefits and costs. I think the people inside them generally think they have lots of benefits. Um, I certainly benefit from it. But I think we have a responsibility to make our systems more open. And I'd like to see that put on the front of every librarian, every technologist's agenda. Second point. Wherever possible, design your systems so that people not only have access to them, but they can actually add content to them and change them, get involved in them, revise them. So Google Maps, again, is an example. The World Wide Web is an example. Free software, open source software is the classic example. English is an example. These are systems where users are also innovators. Now, frequently, this is um, caught up in all kinds of limitations. One major limitation is how do you make money out of that? Um, how do you make money whether you're a for-profit or a not-for-profit? But I think there are ways of making money that don't require locking down the material that you're providing to others, that allow them to put it back. If you want to see an example of what I'm talking about, and it is only a prototype, and it itself may not um, succeed, but I think it's an interesting example, um, the Connections Project at Rice University, Connections spelt with an X, not a CT, uh, is an interesting example. What it is is they have a thing called a knowledge commons, which is a whole bunch of modules. So one module might be on um, the theory of chords or the tonic scale. Another one might be uh, fingering how to, how to finger a guitar or how to uh, use a fretless bass. Another one might be wave mechanics. Another one might be on engineering or programming in um, Ajax. Um, and people put these in, and frequently they put them in because they're professors. So they want to put in their material. They want it to be available. It's a very nice little interface. It's got all kinds of cool ways that you can organize it. But the stuff is deposited not as a course, a finite, here it is, Encyclopedia Britannica. Take it or don't take it. That's your choice. It's put in as a bunch of tiny little modules. And then other people come along and go, actually, you know what's really interesting is I teach guitar. I don't want the whole of the music theory class, but I really love this little first module which is just on the basics of musical notation. That turns out to be hugely interesting. And then I have something totally different going on here. And so people start putting together their roadmaps on how they want to move through them. And they leave the roadmaps as well. The roadmaps just say, hey, try 1A with 17B. And, right? and then other people comment on those. And the commenting gives you your waterhole ranking. Now, that's a really interesting model that I think is the future. Maybe not in connections. I mean, there are all kinds of problems here, right? One is you've got to get enough content in so it's worthwhile people investing in it. That's a huge problem. You've got to seed it. There are all kinds of startup problems here, all kinds of chicken and egg problems. 
But I would like to see us develop something that's a lot more like that. I have to say, this is going to seem a little bit like a setup because I happen to know this is one of John uh, Meyer's uh, enthusiasms. But I have to say that when he contacted me, and I, you can check this on my website, I was already on the advisory board of Connections, already working on all of these issues, already doing this. Um, uh, it's something that I think is something of general interest. I'm actually particularly excited about how it could work in the sciences, and I'd be delighted to talk about that in uh, question and answer. I'm with an organization called Science Commons. I'm trying to allow that both in terms of education and research. So let me um, pull all of these threads together if I can. Um, if I'm right and we're bad at predicting the uses of technology used broadly, software, hardware, communications, etc., and I'm right that we undervalue the contribu contrib contributions of open systems, we can see all the problems, but we don't see all the benefits. What would we expect to see on, let's pick a number of stages, kind of check this intuition. First of all, on the national stage. On the national stage, we would expect content providers, people who are cop have copyrighted content, to be very, very good at predicting all of the negative consequences of lowering copying costs and to be very, very bad at predicting the benefits that they might get out of lowering copying costs. So, for example, when the VCR was introduced, or the Betamax, this would predict that the movie companies would sue to enjoin it. VCRs, terrible. The death of our business model. Why? Because we only sell content two ways. We sell content to as tapes, or license it as tapes to TV companies who then sell your eyeballs to advertisers by playing it. And we run it in movie theaters. That's our business model. And clearly this method of cheap copying in a VCR threatens it fundamentally. It must be copyright infringement, vicarious copyright infringement in this case. Now, the trouble is for doing um, experiments on this is that in most of these cases, the content industry have succeeded in persuading Congress and to a lesser extent the courts that they're right about this. So whenever copying costs drop, they generally succeed in persuading Congress or the courts to say it's illegal. It's a copyright infringement. That technology is against the law or will violate the law. We need to change the law to undercut that technology. But occasionally they lose. And it's really interesting to see what happens when they do lose. They lost on the VCR. And what happened? The price of VCRs continued to drop in the United States, largely because it didn't, they didn't have the features that the uh, movie companies wanted, namely a massive tax on the VCR itself and on the tapes in order to compensate for their presumed lost revenues. And you got the fastest product entry uh, into the marketplace of anything with the possible exception of, of the Internet and cell phones. Soon, within four or five years, the majority of houses had a VCR sitting there with an open slot waiting for content. Where did the content come from? Some of it came from tapes copied from the TV, the thing they didn't want to happen. Some of it came from tapes borrowed from your friend who copied it from t the TV, the thing they really didn't want to come and happen. But most of it came from Blockbuster, and that turned out to be, for the next 15 or 20 years, the majority of the revenues of the film companies. The thing they wanted to destroy became the mainstay of their business. They had correctly predicted some of the downsides and completely failed to predict the upsides. Hey, I've got this thing that plays movies. Am I really going to spend hours taping things and editing out the commercials or arranging with my friends? No, I'm going to get out of Blockbuster and spend three bucks, right? Of course they are. So the great secret about predicting correctly is to predict the past, um, which is what I did, of course. I predicted Sony, the Sony case, and that's, of course, what happened, and the movie companies lost. Thank goodness for them. Right? What other kinds of predictions would this lead us to make? Well, I think it would lead us to expect um, that on the level of the computer, that we would have people pushing very strongly to change the nature of the computer from what it is right now, which is basically a Turing machine, right? A general purpose machine. It can run whatever software you want. There are no limits on it except those imposed by your ingenuity. You can run different operating systems on it. You can use it in lots of different ways, particularly if it's a, uh, if you, if it's a PC and you have the option of going with free software. Uh, you can reprogram, et cetera, et cetera. 
Now, that architecture, allowing openness, allowing revision of the code, is, to me, a feature. But, of course, if you look at it from the point of view of viruses, Trojans, security incursions, and copyright infringement, it's a bug. So the next thing that this would predict is that we would have a very strong pressure, both legislatively and technologically, to change the nature of the computer, to stop making it a general-purpose machine and to turn it back into a terminal, to turn it back to something which only has an approved list of functions and which simply cannot, physically cannot run non-approved functions or functions which have not been recognized. Microsoft Vista. We're moving to the era of trusted computing. Trusted computing will be sold to the public as A, the end to security threats, B, the end to viruses and trojans as security threats, um, C, the way to make sure your kids aren't captured by internet porn predators, and D, the way to prevent illicit uh, copyright infringement. And the latter will be pushed very strongly in Congress in terms of technology mandates, which say that we have to design trusted computing into our computers. For those of you who are interested in trusted computing, you could look at Ross Anderson's FAQ on trusted computing. I won't go into it here. But again, what do we see? Even with the example of the technological revolution enabled by the computer in front of us, our instinct is, danger, danger, Will Robinson, openness. Let's close it up again. Now, the proponents of trusted computing, some of, some of whom I respect uh, greatly, will tell you, that's an exaggeration. That's not the way trusted computing needs to be. I agree. It's not the way trusted computing needs to be. I'm just predicting the way it will be. Finally, I think that we will see an amazing, so I've given you on the level of the law, people will misperceive their interests, including content companies, and seek constantly to close things up. On the level of technology, we will always want to turn away from openness to a systematic level, and in a systematic way. And finally, on the level of educational content and technology, I would predict, again, nothing like improves your success rate like predicting the past. This, in many ways, is a moment of extraordinary promise for scholarship. Most scholars are paid to write, and many of them will be fired if they don't. Most scholars are paid to read, and some of them will be fired if they don't. Many people who edit the journals do it for free because it produces a professional qualification, and worldwide distribution is effectively costless. If in that world I predicted to you that the profit margins of the major educational publishing companies would be over 20%, you'd say I was crazy, but they are, at least the people producing journals. We're in a very interesting, very, very interesting process of tension between open and closed in the world of journals, educational content, and educational software. I don't think that the open model will win or should win everywhere. When I want to know what the Second Circuit said about merger in the copyright context, I don't go to Google. I go to Westlaw, which is a fabulous product. And if they would stop trying to copyright, un copyright un unoriginal compilations of fact, I would love them unreservedly. It's a fabulous product. It does what I want, and I like the top-down control. It's excellent. So it's not that openness is always the answer, but we have a productive tension here. And the question is, given that there are lots of other possibilities out there, including self-archiving by scholars, self-archiving their articles with embedded metadata, which they could put in simply, the use of things like Creative Commons licenses, open access journals, and the traditional journal model, what is the healthy ecology we should see developing? Let me be clear. I want publishers to make lots and lots of money. I'm happy for publishers to make lots and lots of money. But I want them to make money in ways that maximize access and maximize inventiveness of users. Is that the world we're moving towards? Well, that's up for grabs. It's up for grabs in every area of scholarship, and law is one of those areas. My sense is, as we look at how that battle resolves itself, we ought to be wary of our prior failures and prior biases. Thank you very much.
Questions? Sir. Um, uh, the Second Circuit's website is great for that. What um, uh, Westlaw has done that's brilliant, and I would love to see an open source, pers an open source uh, outfit do the same, is get the case which rules on merger and link it to the law review articles that discuss it, all of the other things, so that I can simply, by clicking the hyperlink, go not simply to the article, but the specific portion of the article that discusses that. So what they've done is, taking a leaf from the book of the World Wide Web, use the joy of hyperlinks. Now, how did they do that? Well, they did that through a, some f really fairly ingenious mechanism. The problem about uh, law reviews from the point of view of someone who wants to implement this strategy is that rationally law reviews all ought to be completely open access. They're being funded by law schools. They're being edited by students. <laughs> They're being edited by students. <laughs> Momentary pause. I just have to tell you this. At one point, um, I wrote an article for the Harvard Law Review, in which, which was always a mistake, and the Harvard Law Review said to me, you say that we're obsessed with relativism. You need a site for that. And I said, that could be seen as proof of the proposition that we're obsessed by relativism. <laughs> that one just went, just, you need a site for that. I said, okay, so I cite some philosophy book. He goes, no, you need a site for every discipline, right? So, you know anthropology, I guess agriculture, you know, all the way through to zoology. I had to provide, they wanted a site for each discipline to show they're obsessed by relativism. So I, I said, see Widener Library generally. Um, <laughs> going back to your question, what, the problem about um, law journals is that rationally they all ought to be open access. They all ought to be up on the web, as all of Duke's law journals are, yay, um, perpetually in both PDF and HTML fully search, searchable, uh, available to everyone. But most law journals aren't, why? Brilliant system. West gives lots and lots of money to the law journal editors based on the downloads uh, of the law journal articles by users of Westlaw. Um, now, rationally speaking, it's not clear that the journals um, that the journals would go the journals would go on running anyway, even without that money. It is, after all, a fairly recent environment. But they, of course, like anyone who gets a new stream of money, they've come to like it. Right? It's great to get this extra money. So they've started taking their stuff offline even though arguably that directly contradicts the educational interest uh, of the underlying institution that actually funds their law reviews. Thus, it's only West right now that can provide global and comprehensive linking of the Second Circuit um, uh, opinion on merger to the law review article. Now, if you all were to form up behind the banner that I have unfurled today, a lot more law journals would be open access. If a lot more law journals were open access, then a lot more savvy librarians and programmers and technologists could create an equivalent system to West, which would actually have all of those linking features, which would be done by a distributed universe of people who said, hey, this is a useful link, and actually added things in. And then that could compete head to head with West, and we'd see which one won, which would be great, because I'm in favor of competition. But right now, West, for a variety of reasons, some of them just plain old business savvy, some of them uh, excellent you know, design of interface, and some of them kind of suborning the journals to make sure their content stays private so that West has um, better access to it, they've managed to make theirs the superior product. I would hope that it does not remain unchallenged in that role, however. Another question. Thank you very much. Back to the conference.